1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 29 through 310. Uh, if you're in the Red Bible, it's going to be on page 863. Again, that's 1 John 2, 29 through 310. Now, I'll be reading out of the uh, ESV this morning. God's Word says, If you know that He is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. In our continuation of our, our study, and our look through uh, First John, here we see John laying out to his audience a duality of sorts between practicing righteousness and practicing uh, sin or lawlessness. We, all call, we also can see this with, okay, children of God versus children of the devil. Now, this is not the first time that John uh, uh, writes in this way. We've seen this throughout the entire book. Uh, looking back to the magnificent statement of that God is light back in chapter 1, um, and his people are to walk in the light as compared to walking in the darkness. <clears throat> in the same manner, we are to keep his commandments and not to love the things of the world. And so here we have a continuation of this approach to where we have two parallel ways of living. And so, um, and using similar phrases and also some new ones as well, which we'll get into in just a minute. But he is still reminding his people, <clears throat> again, there are two ways of living. <clears throat> And we'll get into this in just a minute, excuse me. And we see also in this text that John gives his people a great assurance for the present and hope and encouragement for the future. It is important to note that early on in chapter 1, verse 4 of this letter, that John is writing these things so that our joy presently here on earth may be complete. And so we can take and apply what John is teaching us and preaching to us and find great joy in it today. And so looking at verse 29 first, it says, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now, I think it's good to look back at the first, uh, uh, the last couple of uh, verses in uh, chapter 2 here, where John is affirming then that, that those who are a part of this great schism that happened in these churches were not really God's people in the first place. Their leaving the church proved to be so that they were not of us. We can also look towards the end of chapter 2, the frequent use of the word abide, or to remain in Christ that John used. Repeatedly, he told his people to remain in Christ, unlike those who were opposed to him. And in verse 28 it says that of chapter 2, it says that we don't have to be ashamed or fearful of Christ's second coming, but rather we can look forward to it with confidence, because we know that we are his, and his truth and spirit are within us. And so we start here with verse 29 flowing from this thought. And it is because that we have continued to abide in him and walk in the light that we know that he is righteous. And so we see here that there is a knowledge, but even so much deeper, there is a, a union that we have with Christ that the world does not understand. And we'll get into that more in just a minute. 
The text tells us that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now, it's important to see uh, the order of this text. It starts off first that God is righteous. And if he is righteous, then, and if we are his, then we need to reflect who and what he is. We reflect his attributes, mainly his righteousness. Practicing righteousness does not mean merely doing good things. There are many people who are not Christians or believers that can do good things in this world, giving to charity, helping the poor, being there for others who are going through difficult times. Sure, these are morally good things, but there is a distinction with these. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, said, said that righteous means the quality, the kind of life that was lived by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so God's people are then to live in a truth that they are his children. As we've seen earlier in the chapter, uh, or in, in uh, 1 John, it says that we have, if we have come to know God, then we keep his commandments. And so we live out this new heritage that we have been given. And in this, talking about heritage now, uh, here in verse 2, it ends with that we are born of him. Now there's, uh, <clears throat> there's several uses uh, of this, uh, of this uh, type of language throughout uh, other writings of John's, excuse me, <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> there, there's uh, uh, other references to being born of him uh, throughout John's writings. Uh, namely, uh, one of the best ones pretty much is, is uh, John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. It says, <clears throat> to all, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, <clears throat> nor of the will of man, but of God. In uh, John 3, 3 to Nicodemus, Jesus answered him, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some translations on this verse uh, say he must be born from above, okay? And so we see that there is something unique, something distinct that has to happen for someone to be truly a child of God before they can truly practice righteousness. And this can only come from God himself. Theological knowledge, doing morally good things, going to church regularly, all these things are good, yes, but <clears throat> these actions in and of themselves cannot bring us from death to life. We must be born again. As one scholar put it, one's birth defines identity in fundamental and even unchangeable categories. The word years, yeah, used here in the Greek can be translated as to born or has been begotten, involving a radical change in the whole person. And what's important to look at in the grammar here, born of him is in, is in what's called a perfect passive tense, meaning that it is something that has been done to us, not something that we did to ourselves. And again, this is solely a work of God in us, that we no longer have a heart of stone, no longer dead to sin. But now God has given us a heart of flesh, and we are alive in Christ. The great prophet spoke of this in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. They spoke of God giving us new hearts of flesh and a new spirit in uh, 2 Corinthians. Thank you. In 2 Corinthians um, 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so then we are born again, born of him, and we are never the same. Excuse me. And now we look into verse 1. It talks about the kind of love that the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. I underlined that last bit right there because that is very, very important. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It is the kind of love then that distinguishes God's love from that of fallen man or anything else we can experience from the world. In our culture today, we have what Tim Keller used to call consumerist culture. All areas of our life must revolve around our own happiness and satisfaction. We love things and even people as long as they give us what we want. And as soon as they start not to, we look for a way out. 
I have two examples of this. One of them is, is more uh, comedic, and the other one's a bit more uh, uh, serious. Uh, but the, the, the funny one is that in, in the show Friends, there's a, there's a funny scene um, where Ross and Chandler go to an emergency room. I don't remember the context of this, but they rush through this emergency room. They go to the front desk there, and uh, they're trying to get to the lady. Obviously, something is, is uh, there, there's a problem, right? That's why they're there. But the lady there is on the phone, and she's holding this candy bar there, and she's saying, uh, yes, it says to call this number if you're not 100% uh, satisfied. And I am not 100% satisfied. So, and they're trying to like, um, lady, uh, we need your help. She's like, one second. And then she's still on the phone. Now, of course, this is a comedic approach to look at when our satisfaction is priority, right? You want to be 100% satisfied with the product you have bought, right? On a more serious note, I was looking at some uh, studies done in 2022 by the Pew Law Group uh, talking about uh, prenuptial agreements. And it says, researchers have found that roughly 40% of newlyweds and engaged couples between the ages of 18 and 34 have negotiated the prenuptial agreement. This is much higher than we've ever seen uh, in this age group before. And, and the way the report kind of explained this is that young people more and more want to protect themselves in case marriage doesn't phase out to what they thought it would be. And so they put in these clauses that uh, will be beneficial to, to one or the other, right, uh, if it doesn't work out. And what we see from this then is that the love of man and the love of this world so often changes. It is not built on a firm foundation. One second, you got someone telling them that they love you and that they'll always be there, and the next, they are nowhere to be found. We can say that um, many times worldly love, that's all we have, it's all performance-based. It's, it's a competition uh, to win the love of someone or something. But the kind of love that we are shown here and that we are given, bestowed from God, is not like that of this fallen world. It's a love that does not change, and the reason it doesn't change is because it comes from the one who does not change. Our Westminster Shorter Catechism uh, question for it, uh, the question is, what is God? God, and the answer is, God is a spirit, infinite and eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. We can look at Paul's words to the Ephesians in chapter 4. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And so we are children of God. How great a thing it is to know that God has chosen us to be in his family. Though all people, all humans are, are made in the image of God and therefore have great value and dignity, there is a clear distinction of those who are children of God and those who are children of the devil. This distinction can only point to the wonderful mercy and grace and love that the Father has given us through the work of the Son and the gift of the Holy Spirit in us. And this enables us to follow him and to act, and, and, to, and to live as children of God. And so we are his children. The world's response to this is not always a positive one towards us. It says, the text says that the, the world does not recognize the love of God that has been given to us. It is foreign to him. It does not make any sense. And the text also says that they do not know us because, well, they did not know him, referring to Christ. We can look back at uh, John 1. Verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So I think what we can look at this is that, okay, we are children of God, we are set apart, but the world doesn't know him. And so our job then is to be faithful witnesses in the world to the love of God that has been given to us. We do this so that God may be glorified ultimately, and also in hope that those who are outside of God's family to one day be brought in. Moving on in, uh, into the text, looking at verses uh, 2 through 5, I'll repeat these uh, real quick. It says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, 
because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies him as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. And, and uh, what we see here is that there is a future, a great future reality that we can look forward to. But until then, we are to be uh, sanctified, made more and more like him, who, is, uh, who in, in him is no sin. And there is a contrast to what we are now to what we will be later, like him. We see the same language used by Paul in Philippians chapter 3. It says, The Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And in 1 Corinthians 15, seeing him as he, uh, as he is now in heavenly glory. And the sight of him, the author says, will be enough to make us pure like him. We can look at this as the mortal and perishable uh, bodies and things of this life being changed and restored into immortal and imperishable. Being more, be, uh, and, and until that, as each day passes, we are to strive to become more and more like Christ, more and more like the image of God. Now, the word, um, the word used here as to purify ourselves can be translated in uh, as to, to cleanse, right? Or to be holy, to be set apart. And so to purify ourselves as Christ is pure and that he is no sin. So as life goes, we move in this direction. We are to make every effort to avoid and to reject sin. And it's important to remember this uh, parallelism. This is all in contrast to those who do practice sin. The text says this is lawlessness. We can, kind of, we can uh, uh, translate this as to iniquity and to wickedness. These people who we see, as verse 8 says, that they are of the devil. We've talked about children of God being born of him. This is the opposite side of this, children of the devil. Excuse me. And so, if we are children of God, then, then our lives should organically trend more and more towards God and towards his attributes. This trend, of course, is never a straight line for any of us. Because of sin that still remains, it can be a slow and jagged and rocky path indeed. With spiritual victories and possibly some defeats along the way. But even in times where we fail, God, our Father, picks us up when we fall. You can look at this like a father teaching his child to, to ride a bike or to do any kind of uh, activity that involves some kind of balance or eye-hand coordination. Uh, they stumble. They fall. They get themselves hurt. I work in elementary PE. Kids get hurt all the time, you know, walking a straight line. Someone's going to fall and get hurt just doing that. It happens, right? And so, but we are there like a father to pick them up. And he always helps us to get back on track. Moving on um, to this last section here, I bundled together verses um, 6 through 10. And it's a bit repetitive, but, but I'll go into the grammar here in just a second. Because um, <clears throat> all of this is connected here. It says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever, pra whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So, <clears throat> That's a lot there, right? This section has given many, many scholars and commentators a lot of trouble because it seems to be contradicting what John has said previously uh, throughout this letter as far as sinning. Now, uh, certain translations are a little bit more helpful than others. I, I appreciate the, S the ESV uh, and the NIV is, uh, is also very good in this. Uh, but there are some translations that I was looking through that, that makes it seem, and this is kind of like the, the controversy of this uh, of this passage is that it seems to see that 
it seems to say here that anyone who sins then is of the devil, or that no one born of God does not sin, as some translations will say. Meaning, okay, so you're a child of God, but one strike and, and you're out, right? Or you are disqualified from being a child of God, because those born of God don't commit sin, okay? And so we run into a problem here, and we'll get into the, the previous text uh, in just a minute. So we end up with something, and the name of this doctrine is called sinless perfectionism. This view holds that Christians <clears throat> in this present life are able to completely defeat sin and live sinlessly as Jesus did. Now, as we said already, as Christians, we should strive to live lives that avoid and reject sin. But is, poss is it possible that one could live exactly as Christ has? Well, the simple answer is no, and, and John has already addressed this before. If we look into <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1, uh, it says that if we do sin, then we do have an advocate with the Father. So there is already the possibility of sinning right there, right? Uh, going even a little more uh, uh, back into chapter 1, verse 8, it says that if we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. Further, if we claim to have not sinned, then we make God a liar. So it seems to be a bit contradictory there, where the text is saying, if you sin, you're not a child of God. But then John is saying, well, if we sin, but we have an advocate uh, with the Father, right? And those who claim to have no sin are deceiving themselves. So how do we uh, um, <clears throat> look at this <clears throat> excuse me, as a, as a whole? Okay, I think there's two ways to look at this, and both of them have some good evidence for them. All right, The first <clears throat> is we look at um, the word lawlessness that was used in verse 4, where John is equating sin with lawlessness. Now, the, the, the way this view is kind of laid out is that lawlessness here is tied into uh, a passage in 2 Thessalonians verse 2 as the man of lawlessness. I preached on this a little bit uh, several weeks ago. <clears throat> it says, um, the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians is the great apostate figure who is uh, there to persecute the church uh, in the last days. Again, we don't know who this is, or if it's a person, or if it's a government organization, or whatever, we don't know, right? But there is some man or figure of lawlessness that will come about in the last days and openly and militantly oppose Christ and his followers. And so lawlessness, we can look at it in verse 4, is the sin of apostasy. What, what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> someone who at one time had professed Christ, but has now rejected key truths of Christianity. Someone has denied Christ and is now working directly in opposition to him. I think this describes well the false teachers that have seceded from the church as, we, as we've been looking from 1 John. They were in the church, but they're leaving the church show that they were not of us. Um, and so what many scholars put forward is that the remarks of sinning here in verses 6 through 10 are referring to that sin of apostasy. And it makes sense that the Christian who abides in Christ, who has God's truth in his heart, who has his Holy Spirit, who has been made new, will not reject and oppose Christ. They will not commit this great sin. But instead, as Scripture teaches, they will persevere to the end. And Christ will not lose any of his sheep. For this sin, uh, this great sin, is of the devil himself and his children. Now, looking at God's children, though, yes, they still sin occasionally, but will never reject or, or abandon Christ. And that is his promise to us. That's the first view, okay? The second one, which I think is a little bit closer to what John is getting at uh, here. Um, we can take a good use, a good close look at the grammar that's used in verses 6 through 10, right? These are, um, uh, the verbs used for sinning are a present and active, ongoing, um, sinful lifestyle, right? I like, I like the way the ESV says practicing sin. I think the uh, NIV says uh, keep on or continuing sinning. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, we can look at this as a habitual pattern of sin, unrepentant. Our, um, that's what we're looking at here. So are Christians, are they perfect? Certainly not. Do they still sin occasionally? Yes, as do all of us until Christ returns. But we are still children of God. 
They no longer dwell in their sin. Though they might slip up, they, might, they live in the reality that they are no longer chained to these former sins. There is no dominion of sin over them. Christ took care of that. Remember earlier in the letter, we have Christ as our great advocate with the Father when we do stumble. And we know it, as verse 8 tells us here, that Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. So now here we have a clear distinction between a child of God and a child of the devil. A Christian is still a Christian is still in God's family, even if he or she does commit sin, which, I mean, honestly speaking, we all do from time to time. But there's a difference, there's a distinction from those of the devil. <clears throat> and by God's grace and mercy and promise to us, we can practice righteousness. We can persevere to the end. But again, looking at the other side, the children of the devil commit sins habitually and rebel against God. And again, as the text says, well, they were not of us, even if they were in the church for a period of time. This is a lot, but thank you for sticking with me. I'll end on this. That any of us could be called children of God is a miracle that only he could bring about. And he brought it about through his son, who willingly, came, who willingly came to live and to die among us, that we could be brought into his family. <clears throat> For many of us, the word family uh, holds a certain weight to it. Many of us have maybe gone through some familial trauma or some controversies or just some garbage that just happens even within families. We've all got some crazy stories, I'm sure, where it was the ones that we were supposed to be closest to that hurt us the most. Maybe at times within a family we have felt unwanted or unloved, that though we shared the name of a person or a certain family, we, we felt completely alone and alienated. But you see, God's family is one where the price of death was paid in full by God's own son, so that we could enter into it. Though we were dead in sin, his sacrifice made us alive in him. And we don't have to look at this as if it's just some chance thing that we, uh, let's say, if <clears throat> that if God uh, owned a house and that one night uh, we just stumbled onto it and he felt pity and decided to let us in, you know, I'd say, hey, you know what, I'm going to adopt you, right? Um, it's not like that. I think it's an inaccurate way to look at this because we miss the beauty and grace of intentionality of the story. Our being brought into God's family was not just some random, by chance event that happened, that we hit the lottery or just happened to be lucky enough to, to walk into God's family, but rather God chose us for adoption into his family himself through the Son. And I wanted to <clears throat> close on this last verse here. It's a John uh, 14, 2 through 6. It says, In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going? Thomas replied to him, uh, Thomas the Apostle, <clears throat> Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so bringing it all full circle, it is through Christ, the Son of God, that we have been made children of God. And so we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our great heritage and this love <clears throat> that you have bestowed upon us. So the words cannot even begin to explain uh, um, the depths of this love that you have for your children, Lord. We know it is true that we are yours, Lord. We thank you for your word that reassures and encourages us, Lord, that we are your children and how great a father that we have in you, Lord. I pray that in each and every one of us, and as we live our lives, that we can walk with confidence and insurance, reflecting the love and the, and, and the mercy and the grace and all your attributes, Lord, because we know who our Father is. We pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning. Uh, please stand if you're able to for the last time of worship. Sorry.
Um, I, I mean, while you're waiting, I will trust my Savior Jesus when my darkest doubts be full. Trust Him when to simply trust Him seems the hardest thing of all. I will trust my Savior Jesus, trust Him when my strength is small. For will I know the shield of Jesus is the safest place of all? Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. I will trust my Savior Jesus, he has said his way is best. For I know the path he's chosen leads to everlasting rest. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. Oh, on that cross, how it was seen, I can go now ever trusting in the one who died for me. What could I bring for your gift is complete? So I trust you, simply trust you, Lord, with every part of me. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. May my heart.